Controversial film director Lars von Trier continued his trend of antagonizing audiences in 2011 with his film Melancholia, which is both a disturbing personal depiction of clinical depression and an operatic tale of the end of the world. Despite Melancholia's many awards and broad critical acclaim, most viewer and critical responses reflect aversion to the narrative, often receiving it as a nihilist polemic, a torturous meditation on destructive depression, and outright sadistic in its approach to the audience. Although there are a few viewers who do report experiencing the film in the opposite way, as ecstatic or even life-affirming, but many typically respond with a deep conflict, as evidenced by the reaction from David Edelstein, NPR's Fresh Air film critic. Although Edelstein deems Melancholia, quote, a masterpiece, he insists he couldn't recommend the film in good conscience for a year-end top ten list because, quote, it is such a hateful film. It is the work of a nihilistic annihilist. Can you love a film? Can you recommend a film that highly, that peddles a worldview that you find utterly hateful, even poisonous? In this essay, I'll examine how melancholia can be read otherwise, as a modern version of the kind of tragic art in the Dionysian sense that Friedrich Nietzsche develops in his Birth of Tragedy. First, I'll give you a sense of how Nietzsche deployed this Dionysian ancient tragic art as a way of getting at a very precise problem. How can you have an art that represents death without despairing or retreating in the face of it? And what is the function of this tragic art for society? After establishing Nietzsche's ideas of the positive function of tragedy, we'll turn to take a detailed look at the forms in Melancholia that reflect Nietzsche's influence on Lars von Trier and how this philosophy has shaped the delivery of Melancholia's narrative and how this affects the viewer and why. Having determined those connections, I'll then explore how the resulting philosophy reflected through the aesthetic forms in Melancholia creates a gestalt that operates in a way opposite to how Melancholia is popularly received. My explanations of the philosophy of Nietzsche will be facilitated through the work of Sylvie Magerstad in her uh, dissertation, Illusions for Life, wherein she draws on theories uh, put forward by Nietzsche in The Birth of Tragedy, such as the redemptive capacities of art and aesthetics, what that redemption means, and the acknowledgement that illusion, art, and what she argues later, cinema, um, is always closely related to the state of the society that produces that work. She argues that this type of illusion, this redemptive illusion, rather than being merely escapism, has an important function in providing postmodern culture with essential illusions. And her thesis then looks at the way in which cinema, like myth and religion before, continues to create these redemptive illusions in a unique, cognitively resonant way that is unprecedented in artistic history, and how these illusions can provide meaning for our lives in the face of postmodern nihilism. In The Birth of Tragedy, Nietzsche draws heavily on ancient Greek culture and looks at their product of ancient tragic art. Um, he argued that human beings have always had an instinctive drive to create illusions in the form of myth or of art, and that function, that drive, enabled them to consciously deal with the cruelty and unpredictability of daily life. Instead of hiding from those realities, they were able to face them and deal with them. Here's a quote, tragic insight needs art as a protection and remedy merely to be endured. In the genealogy of morals, Nietzsche talks about how the beautiful produces the arousal of the will like a sensual triggering mechanism. Arousal of strong emotion 
And so uh, the subduing of suffering through, quote, excess of the emotions, which are the most effective means of anesthetizing the dull, paralyzing, long painfulness, unquote. Philosopher Eric Bronson has argued that according to Nietzsche, it's the role of the artist to proclaim happiness, especially in situations that seem to be hopeless. And he adds that artists look at the pain of this world and do more than reproduce our own world. They add to it, they enliven it. And so Bronson says for Nietzsche, the artist can only exist in times of crisis. It is um, the darkness that the artist must light. Nietzsche describes the loss of binding norms and unifying concepts as a gradual process that affected post-enlightenment society and that events can shatter old systems of images and beliefs which leave individuals in modern or for us postmodern modernity um, it leaves those individuals lacking ideological or spiritual certainties, ideas that they can hold on to. And so then they long for those certainties. They long for ideals and they, they continue the process of creating illusions um, that don't help them deal with realities. They deal with ideals, um, certainties that don't exist. And so reading Nietzsche, but specifically The Birth of Tragedy, it soon it becomes very clear that that book in particular is not primarily just an examination of um, ancient Greek tragedy, but rather it's um, it's studying the reason for art in general and the type of society it stems out of and it produces, and so for how it functioned well for ancient Greece was that it allowed that society to face harsh, re harsh realities of life and, and not retreat from them. And so through, throughout the birth of tragedy, he, he brings up an aesthetic justification of artistic practice um, as a way that we can justify our life. This, this practice of creating illusion that doesn't separate you with your connection to the physical world is what creates meaning in a world where you might have found none. Nietzsche uses the term redemption in a very specific way. It describes a process that brings back to us this sense of unity and belief which previously seemed lost and so he removes it from the non-literal spiritual sense or maybe even a moral connotation but he uses redemption in a very specific way to talk about this problem of separation from from illusions and then the process of bringing back a sense of unity Nietzsche then tries to find an example of this redemptive function of tragedy in his own milieu and looks to specifically the prelude for Wagner's Tristan and Isolde opera. He uses this as a vehicle to talk about an ideal type of art that combines visual and music to create a gestalt that would push the buttons of emotion, that would be painful to experience but that would as a result, create meaning for the audience and not distract them from the realities of life. And so interestingly, back to Lars von Trier's Melancholia, von Trier has chosen to use specifically the prelude to Wagner's Tristan and Isolde for the entirety of the soundtrack. And he does this in almost a very mean-spirited way um, when we talk a little bit more about how this music in particular works. The prelude is the beginning to the opera and it uses what is now called the Tristan chord. The chord um, uses dissonance 
it never resolves to a major. It creates a tension within the listener, longing, waiting for the chords to finally end and resolve. But the chords keep moving in patterns that create anxiety and tension, and they never release. A normal audience member would get to watch the rest of the opera, and they would get to have many resolves. But von Trier chooses to only use this prelude, and he repeats it over and over again. He does this in a way that creates a visceral tension and longing in the audience members without them even be being cognitively aware that he's doing that. This longing is something reflective of the character of Justine. Um, she is a melancholic and she is longing for something of true value. Film scholar Torben Grodal, in his work on melancholia, talks about von Trier's use of this music, but he expounds a little further and talks about how the music working with the visuals functions to evoke anxiety and panic in the viewer by providing ambiguous reality indicators and um, he explains this through cognitive science. Grodel explains that von Trier's aesthetics often seem to belie motion and um, it's especially clear how he does this in the prologue of Melancholia, where his pictures are slowed down to an almost frozen image. And the, the forward thrust in Melancholia is delivered by this passionate pace of Wagner's Tristan and Isolde that expresses this longing, this never-ending repetitive longing, while these images are delivered in an almost supernatural way. The colors are completely blown up. Um, it's very majestic. It looks like portraiture. And yet, they're not allowed necessarily to move. It creates sort of an abstraction. Um, and the slow motion serves uh, as an emotional constraint. It creates an anxiety, according to Grodel. And so, what Grodel says von Trier achieves is one of, quote, um, touching the accelerator and the brake at the same time. In addition to the aesthetic of the images, there is the content of the images, which clearly foreshadow and spell out to the audience that this is a disaster film. The world is definitely going to come to an end. Um, von Trier very carefully and clearly lays out the end of everything for all of us and then he begins the film at a regular pace and lets the audience sit with this knowledge that we're going to slowly move toward the death of the world and this is a very classic um, mechanism of creating tension and anxiety that's really well explained by Alfred Hitchcock in his interview with Francois Truffaut um, where Hitchcock explains that showing the audience something that the players in the narrative don't know um, creates a physical tension within the viewer because they are unable to yell out a warning or help and they're physically trapped in this social situation with, with the players that they are watching. They're trapped in their seat, they're not going to leave as they watch something terrible happen and they're unable to communicate a warning. This is a very effective effect on the audience that Lars von Trier plays out beautifully in his use of the prelude and his pairing it with the music, which continues on as a reminder of that prelude because that mood has been set. That prelude will return over and over again throughout the film as a reminder to the audience, don't forget what you know is coming. After the initial prelude, the film falls clearly into two parts. The first part is labeled Justine and deals specifically with her dealing with depression and her disastrous wedding. The second part of the film bears the title Claire, which is Justine's sister. Um, this covers the countdown to the end of the world, but also 
clearly delineates the difference between the two sisters um, for a very specific reason that ties to the prelude, but I'm going to come back to that. The first half of the film, which shows Justine as a, a creative, successful woman who cannot seem to um, engage in the rituals of society happily, serves a function for Von Trier because it shows a problem in the conventional rituals of love, or marriage, or career fulfillment. It cannot stand up to the realism of the melancholic. The melancholic has a, a clear worldview. It longs for ideals, but sees these cultural illusions for what they are, and uh, Justine is sent into a nihilistic immobility um, in her depression because of this uh, longing for for the perfect that's promised by these conventional um, structures, but through which she can clearly see, and it leaves her destroyed. So this world of human conventions is destroyed by the apocalypse of the wedding. The audience is expecting the apocalypse of the world, but these very safe structures that we know to uh, be normal in life, Von Trier is systematically removing these throughout the film, not just in the first half, but with a very dark sense of humor, all the comforting social fictions of marriage and social status and career are obliterated. The contrast between the hypocrisies of how we like life to be and the grim honesty of a depressive or melancholic view of how things really are um, begins to ridicule the film's characters. They aren't evil. Von Trier posts them up as fragile and almost ludicrous, um, certainly avoidant of the truth. Another world destroyed by the film, um, in a meta way, is the world of Hollywood narrative convention of the disaster film, because in Melancholia, you don't see large cities in flames, there's no frantic media reports, you don't see crowd panic. It's a catastrophe that happens not on a, on a grand world stage, but in close-ups in the eyes of the tortured characters. The disaster, the apocalypse that Melancholia is leading the audience to is an irrevocable inescapable end of all reality it's more it's made more final because of the verbiage that he has Justine employ where she removes all possibility of afterlife of aliens by presenting Justine with a sort of artist's um, supernatural knowing he allows the narrative to pull the rug out from underneath the audience's basic safety illusion, which is even if we die, the world goes on, life goes on, something goes on. Um, Von Trier's final move to remove that safety of illusion is to make sure that when we arrive at the ending, nothing could be more final. And now remember, when Von Trier was was uh, interviewed about this film he says in a way the film does have a happy ending and it might be his only film that does have a happy ending most of the press obviously consider this to be a a joke later I'm going to argue why he actually is being literal there is a way that this is a happy ending so Von Trier has created a what's called sort of a, a leitmotif. It's a return of themes over and over again, much like what he's doing already with the music. He returns to the ominous specter of Melancholia, the planet arriving to destroy all life. But he also creates um, a leitmotif of returning 
to the destruction of conventions, um, the destruction of illusions, and um, these things continue to return as a central concern. And part of his humor is how he has the characters face this this returning oncoming threat of the of the planet. Um, they seem to think maybe if I look at the planet again, it'll be gone or it won't be coming. But um, there it is again, and they they can't seem to face this reality, this certainty coming to them um, with insistence, like the real knocking at their door again and again. And this is happening in the film, but it's also happening simultaneously to the viewer. Von Trier, when interviewed, said that he specifically wanted a type of aesthetic for his film that would be a clash between what is romantic and grand and stylized and then some, some form of reality. Now, um, he does that a bit through a handheld camera for the most part, but he's doing it more through message than through aesthetics. So it's a balance of these romantic, stylized um, aesthetics and then a persistent message as a counterbalance. The style overall is not remotely realistic. And this is acting in form to illustrate the problem between the longing and entertaining um, aspects, the, the seductive aspects of certain pretty illusions in contrast to the nagging reality that is not on the surface, that's underneath, but always returning, always there. So back to the split in the story. Uh, after the first part, which seems to outline Justine's character, who seems to be completely unable to live life, um, she's contrasted against her sister Claire, who seems to be a very successful person, um, and very together, and even taking care of Justine. However, as the story progresses toward the end of the earth, Claire and every other responsible, level-headed person in the story tends to come completely apart. Um, in having to deal with this eventuality and, and to in the experience of of the eventuality of their death. The only person it is revealed able to handle this situation is Justine. To explain a little bit about Lars von Trier's approach to that, we're going to look at his personal experience behind the writing of this character. It's been said that laying out the story by telling the audience at the beginning that we're all going to die and then slowing, slowly, slowly leading us there is very sadistic. But Lars von Trier, when interviewed, said that this can, quote, be exciting nonetheless. Some things may be thrilling precisely because we know what's going to happen but not how they will happen. In Melancholia, it's interesting to see how the characters we follow react as the planet approaches Earth. This begins to speak to Lars von Trier having his female protagonists be very much self-portraits. He has said that Justine is very much based on himself and um, based on his personal experiences with depression and anxiety. Um, after coming out of a very severe depression, von Trier's analyst told him that melancholics are usually more level-headed than ordinary people in disastrous situations. And part of this speaks to what Nietzsche was talking about, about ancient Greek society and the function of tragic art in that when a person is faced with reality, with the harshness of life, he's better able to deal with it than someone who's been sheltered from the harshness. And why um, attic tragedy served a very positive function for the polis in that it helped people who might be the most sheltered ever in, in the history of humanity um, were still exposed to harsh truths in a transformative way that helped them to be prepared for the unfairness of life. Nietzsche said that illusions are essential to our well-being um, when dealing with that harshness and that... Um, 
clinically depressed individuals typically are devoid of larger societal illusions and tend to typically have a a pretty accurate self-perception and world perception. Um, They find that their self-perception is one that corresponds to what others actually think about them. And these realities can be incredibly depressing. And so then what in the creation of illusion can be helpful to the nihilist, the the clear-sighted melancholic that has seen through the world and arrived at no meaning. How can illusion serve them? Justine, throughout the film, seems to push back at involving herself in rituals that have no meaning. And so now we come to the end of the film. First, I'm going to start slowly by saying the end of the film is a repeat of the beginning of the film in a way. Um, The prelude is a juxtaposition of different vignettes, different moments from the end of the world that are that are in a way replayed or alluded to at the end of the film but but not in the same way at all. Um, It's almost like taking a mirror image of the idealized prelude to the realistic ending. Although, again, this film is not realistic in any way, but compared to the prelude, these are normal shots. There are no grandiose, completely geometric um, visual patterns. Everything's handheld, and this is what's called a ring structure. Um, It's meant to draw the attention of this um, dichotomy to the audience. A comparison of the real ending of the world compared to the idealized ending that we were made to long for and expect and wait for from the beginning of the film. There's a function in that. In fact, there are a few dual functions in that. Um, Ring structure is an ancient um, Greek narrative structure that serves to notice a dichotomy but also when there is a ring structure it tells you to it points you to the center of the narrative to perhaps look for a flip there and that underscores the difference again between the two halves of the film the difference between Justine's um, portrayal and Claire's portrayal and then their final reaction to this catastrophe noticing and thinking about that again we experience the ending, and the ending, I'll argue, is crucial to understanding why this film is not nihilistic. After Von Trier makes these comparisons through form between idealized longing and reality, it's really revealing that he allows Justine to stage or make theatrical their death scene. She ends in a creative act, and this fact is crucially important to any adequate reading of the film. She and her nephew spend their last moments on Earth um, creating a magic cave. And in relation to the movie's leitmotif, it's an affirmation of the only place one can find consolation, which is in aesthetic creation, in art. Uh, Nietzsche's quote, healing enchantress. In this cave of artistic creation, Justine herself is transformed beyond illusion and beyond the despair that follows the end of illusion. She becomes heroic, she becomes compassionate, and the term redemption suddenly appears for us and if we apply it to how Nietzsche meant redemption we are reconnected to the meaning in the physical world. The juxtaposition of the camera angles and the ending clearly compare Claire and Justine one last time. Claire, the the logical level-headed person that we all as audience members are supposed to identify with has no skills to deal with this event and is coming apart entirely incapable of helping her child. While Justine is in the midst of a creative act and the culmination of that act ends in the shot of her nephew who is entirely serene and calm-faced. And this shows 
the result for society in this creative act of the artist that Nietzsche speaks of. So in fact, this does represent a hopeful, positive, happy ending in the face of the certainty of all of our deaths by removing the possibility of the hope of an afterlife, of, of past and future lifetimes, of alien life living on um, past us. Bontrier makes us face the inevitability of our deaths and makes us question if there is nothing else, what then is left? And he is expressing through form and through narrative the message in Nietzsche's Birth of Tragedy that the aesthetic is what creates meaning for us in the face of a nihilistic existence. It's ironic that people found von Trier's comment of this film having a happy ending to be a joke um, because they also found his one sheets um, the the print material that advertised for the film to also be a joke if you'll remember in the wedding scene Justine's very negative mother bitterly announces in her toast enjoy it while it lasts and she's talking very negatively um, about the illusions of marriage that quickly dissipate. Now, Von Trier chose that line specifically for all the advertising work for this campaign, and um, the press and the public found that, again, to be very mean-spirited, enjoy it while it lasts, so disappointing, so negative. But I posit that he is being literal, that he is trying to use the film in an artistic vehicle, in an artistic way, Dionysian way in the way that Nietzsche described to wake people up to the realities that they're always trying to hide from the reality of death by the illusions that that tend to fall apart that don't hold up and he's trying to show them how there are ways to create meaningful illusion in our lives that help us to survive reality <laughs> 